Oh, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much for this invitation, distinguished guests, Minister, President, regional uh, commissions that are here. It is, in fact, uh, it is uh, just really an honor to be here because um, when I think about a Saturday morning, Saturday afternoon, that has uh, has essentially brought together people from all levels of government, uh, not only uh, here in Greece, but your international partners. It's, it's really quite amazing. So, so thank you very much. As George uh, said, um, we're here to just talk about the importance of Earth observations and and collaboration. And I think we just have to look around the room and see that collaboration for addressing societal issues. And of course, the focus will be a lot on uh, on agriculture. Um, but I want to be clear when when we in the group on Earth observations talk about Earth observations. We're talking about space-based observations. We're talking about atmospheric observations. We're talking about uh, terrestrial observations, and then, of course, marine observations at all uh, also. So what we will be talking about is a lot of space-based observations, and many of the speakers this afternoon will focus on those. But I think um, certainly George and maybe the minister actually talked about observations that are taken on the ground that are so important to integrate with these space-based observations. So our vision is really to take the observations that you saw from the devices on the previous slide and just make sure that they inform your decisions. And I think what's so important about the regional cooperation and the national co collaboration and or the representation from local governments, it is at those levels where these decisions are occurring. So we just want to make sure that any information we have us to is available to you and it feeds into your decisions. So we talk about a graphic like this that shows space-based observations, atmospheric observations, ground-based observations, and that all of these observations can work across multiple platforms and address multiple issues. <clears throat> so Today, we're largely going to focus on that food security and sustainable agriculture, but one of the things that we're seeing with all the observations that we have access to is that in many instances, the same observations can help biodiversity and ecosystem sustainability, disaster resilience, uh, energy and uh, uh, mineral resource development, infrastructure and transport management, all the way down to water resources. If we think about the effects of climate change, and uh, we talked a little bit last night in a smaller group about climate change and decisions that are being made around the world, I think it's really important to show that any impacts on climate really will touch each one of those issues. We happen to call them societal benefit areas. Right now we have 105 member countries. I'm happy to say that Greece has been a member right from the beginning. Bulgaria joined two years ago. We certainly would be uh, willing to talk to anybody in the room if your country is not colored on this map. Um, but we still have some challenges, South America, Africa, in the Gulf states, and a couple challenges right here in the Balkan area. And of course, we'd like to talk to you afterwards about that. But I think what's really important important on this next slide, and I've circled IBEC, the Inter-Balkan Environment Center, of which we have the chairman of the board and also the executive director here, because already in an organization like that, they are working across country lines. So IBEC, uh, right 
in the middle there is uh, George's institution. But what I've also done is circle a couple other organizations like this to you. One is Godin. And the, it's, a, it's an organization for open data on agriculture. And I've also circled the World Bank because if we think about resources being available for some of these issues, then I think so that additional resources could be brought to bear. And then I think also on this slide, uh, I can't quite see it, but I've circled uh, ESA, the European Space Agency, because you will be hearing from them later on this afternoon. The other speakers, whether it's uh, NASA, uh, Lawrence Friedel uh, and Adita will be talking to you this afternoon, or Argy uh, Cavallo will be talking to you this afternoon, they come up through our member governments, our member states. So um, you will see here that the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development is one of our engagement priorities as we look over the next couple years. And if you haven't seen a graph like this, you will have seen a lot of it by the end of the day. It is, in fact, the 17 Sustainable Development Goals that have been adopted by not only the United Nations, but your member states who are part of the United Nations. We worked really hard with those people in New York to get Earth observations and geospatial data data acknowledged in this entire 2030 agenda because it is your statistical agencies and your census bureaus who will largely be in uh, the driver's seat for measuring and monitoring progress on these sustainable development goals. So we want to make sure that the GEO members and those organizations are working with the Census Bureaus and statistical agencies in each of your governments. And you will also be hearing from Adita a little later on with, with this um, uh, global partnership for sustainable development data of which GEO is working very closely with. Another international effort to make sure that our messages internationally, regionally, and nationally are all consistent on the importance of Earth observations, geospatial data for monitoring and measuring those sustainable development goals. You'll see a graph like this. We have a team. You'll hear from them later. Earth observations for sustainable development. And while the goals are all shown down the uh, uh, y-axis, there are many products that are being generated globally that can help contribute to measuring and monitoring uh, this effort. And then lastly, uh, led by NASA and JAXA and Mexico, we put together case study report. I think I might even look at this like tools. Some of you have already talked about the importance of bringing tools to the date table, and uh, this report would show some of those products and or tools where data is used for the SDGs. Um, you heard this morning reference to GeoGLAM, GEOs, the Group on Earth Observations, Global Agricultural Monitoring Initiative. The next couple talks will be on that. But I did want to put one slide here to show show you the G20 agricultural ministers that back in 2011 said they wanted GEO, our organization, working with AMOS, the Agricultural Marketing Information System, to bring more uh, stability to the prices of at least the four major food crops. Rice is one of those. So the G20 agricultural ministers issued us guidance to work with Amos, and it's this program that you're going to hear a lot of detail uh, on because 
uh, as George said, the Minister for Rural Development and uh, Food Security is actually on the advisory committee for GeoGlam. So I just want to spend the next couple minutes talking about the importance of broad open data sharing, another point that we advocate. You'll see a number of uh, elements that come out of broad open data sharing. Research and innovation, I think it's so important for the universities around the table, as is education. Capacity building in the documentation for this initiative that you're here to talk about today. Capacity building is a big element. Effective governance and policy making, you certainly heard that from the minister today about we must bring, we must make our, um, our, our policy decisions and our governance structures more closely aligned, certainly social welfare, and then economic growth. I'm just going to pull out a couple of these points to show you a little bit more experience that we've had in these areas. Before I do that, I want to say that our infrastructure, the GEO's information infrastructure, also feeds into the digital policies that were referenced earlier today. We have, of course, a website. We have a portal that is operated by ESA, the European Space Agency. We have something called a discovery and access broker, which accesses all the information that you see on the left-hand side. There are more than 400 million resources in this infrastructure. So those are either governments, that make their data available or agencies. You will see a couple that I have circled here on both food security and also the satellite-based satellite observations that are largely coordinated by CIAS, the Committee on Earth Observation Satellites. So through GEO's infrastructure, you can get access to more than 400 million resources. We're getting about 5 million hits a year on this entire infrastructure. But I want to be clear, just like Uber is one of the largest enterprise uh, rental car enterprises around, but they do not own one rental car. Or just like Airbnb, which is a rather large hotel uh, enterprise, but they don't own one hotel room. GEO is the same way. We are the largest Earth observation entities, but we, GEO, do not own one piece of data. You own all the data. So all those institutions that you saw on the left-hand side of that graph own the data. You control the access. You control the quality assurance of those data. In an interoperability agreement with you, we discover and then allow access to that uh, data. So I want to be clear about who still owns the data. It's governments, it's institutions, it's organizations. So in per, just real quickly to talk about some economic uh, indicators of broad open data policies. Later on, you will hear a lot about the role that either Landsat satellites or the Sentinel series satellites here in Europe are providing to agriculture. When the first Landsat satellite went up in the United States in 1972, up until 2007, the data was always sold. For $500 a scene, when the federal government operated the satellites, four or five thousand dollars a scene when the private sector operated the satellites in the mid 80s. And at the time I was in the United States, the government agencies came together. We were able to convince the White House, Congress, the Office of Management and Budget. Who is buying those 53 scenes a day? So before the data policy changed, 53 scenes a day 
were uh, being accessed for Landsat data. Who was buying it? Number one, the Department of Agriculture. Number two, universities uh, funded by the National Science Foundation. Number three, contractors funded by the Defense Department. We were just recycling federal money for those 53 scenes a day. So we said, let's give the data away over the web. And what you see now is it went from 53 scenes a day to 5,000 scenes a day that are being downloaded from this data set. We think you will see any kind of statistics with the Sentinel series of satellites here in Europe because of the broad open data policies. It happened to be my agency was taking in four and a half million dollars a year for selling those 53 scenes. As soon as the data was given away, the economic benefits to the United States were $1.7 billion, $400 million elsewhere. That means that even here, ben ben economic benefits are gained from broad open data policies for a global total of $2.1 billion, which far exceeds the $4.5 million that one federal agency was taking in. So we advocate that if you are a public institution, and it doesn't matter if it's a space agency, uh, a meteorological agency, a geological agency, a hydrologic agency, if you are selling data, you are mostly creating a barrier for your sister agencies to use that data it should be given away to them more broadly and openly, and your economy will benefit from that. So um, I don't think these next couple slides are going to work. I've got an animation in there, but uh, it does show that uh, Australia has ingested the entire Landsat archive into something they call a data cube. I believe Brian Killer will be talking about this later. And you can go through that entire almost 40 year record and start looking at every 25 meter uh, pixel area where there's water throughout the entire history where it's been dry. And wouldn't it be amazing if we could not just take the water algorithm, but take cropping algorithms, take forest algorithms, take urban growth algorithms, and superimpose them in these tools called uh, data cubes so that you can start really looking at landscape change uh, over time. 27 years of data uh, in three hours of uh, compute time. So. I think we in the group on Earth observations are fond of saying this, and I think it's quite aligned with the minister's remarks this morning. International countries have borders. Earth observations don't. We've seen already countries have borders, but those challenges that we have with agriculture or disasters or climate change do not have boundaries. These are physical processes that it's just really important that we work together collaboratively. So in closing, I think from the group on Earth perspective, we have a couple of key messages. Collaboration at national, regional, regional and international levels essential. Uh, You might read or interdependencies that you see in healthy biological ecosystems. If you have a biological ecosystem and one partner, the whole ecosystem suffers. And I think the same thing happens with our international and national collaboration. We have those participating organizations. We've got to work collaboratively on these challenges. 
policies must be leveraged to leverage to those to really leverage those existing um, planned national, regional, global investments to uh, to uh, to optimize multilateral agreements. But those policies must be advanced. We still have many parts of the world where particularly ground-based data is not available. And then lastly, I think we are really going into an era where technological uh, advancements for terrestrial observations, land-based observations, like the data cube technology, is really bringing us up into the century that we belong. And I think one would argue that the meteorological communities and maybe even the oceanic communities have been doing these for decades. We've got to bring uh, uh, land-based observations uh, up to that same point. Uh, lastly, our geoplenary is uh, in Washington, D.C., technical site events on the 23rd and 24th. Uh, the actual formal meeting is on the 25th and 26th of October, and uh, it would be wonderful if we could see many of you, particularly you, uh, uh, Minister, uh, at this meeting, and uh, either as part of the Greek delegations or uh, IBEC in that participating organization. So thank you very much. We'll, uh, we'll end there, and George, I'll turn it back to you. Barbara, thank you for your uh, uh, ideas and your efforts are driving us to where we would like to be. And hopefully, in October, in October uh, along with the minister, we will, we will be in Washington. Since we have not uh, with us uh, yet uh, the, uh, the General Secretary of uh, the Ministry of Digital Convergence, I, uh, we are going to continue with the technical session. And now I would like to welcome to the roundtable of the meeting, uh, of the meeting uh, our uh, friend, uh, the Rector, Mr. Perikisopoulos. Zoran? And come uh, up to resume your. Uh, I'm saying you are going to be picking from there or from here. Uh, I can speak from there. Okay, from. Okay, okay. Uh, Peace is that. And also, I would like to say that in the meeting we have with us. Uh, Mr. Brian Kilom from the NASA Space Agency. He Earth Observation Guides. We have with us from the Space Agency, who is the founder of the Earth We have with us also Mr. Espen Volden, who is from the ESA, responsible for the Agrofood Platform. Ores, is he here? And also, we will have Lawrence from NASA for the Sustainable Development Goals. There will be also a Greek lady from abroad, Mrs. Argiro Kavada, who works at NASA. And uh, last but not least, we will have with us from global Pri from the global the global partnership for sustainable development, Mr. Adidio. And all together, we will have a discussion on the state of the, of the on the current state of the art in relationship of flow of satellite imaging, the transformation into services, and uh, the current uh, situation, the current status uh, on uh, the capacity of uh, the member states and of the regional administrations to respond to uh, be able to reach uh, the sustainability indices of uh, the 2030 Agenda. Michelle, the floor is yours for, uh, on GeoGlam. 
And since uh, that we have also the minister with us, who is a member of the executive board of the Geoglam agency, it is good uh, for him to see what happens there. Thank you. Okay. So I'm going to present uh, Geoglam, uh, initiative of Geo, uh, which means global agricultural monitoring. So the question is that it starts by the, the problem that feeding the planet is not over. As you know, the world population is still growing, the crop area is still the same, and um, if it is going on, it's simply that the, 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 the world crop production is increasing thanks to the fact that the yields are increasing, but it's not fully uh, uh, regular. As you can see, there are up and downs. They are not only up and downs, but you can see on the price market, we have here a graph which shows that for the first period, the, uh, the, the price was 75 for the, for the wheat per, per ton, and then it became 250, and in the last uh, period, a recent period, it came to 300. So the question is that this has come to the fact that the G20 at one moment took over the issue and said, let's have better information for, for the, the crop. And they started the, um, the, the, the Amis, Amis and Joglam together. Uh, agricultural market um, information system and global agricultural monitoring. Um, Amis is I work on the offer, the demand, the price, the policies, all the economics issue, and Geoglam. Wait. Okay. Ah. Okay. Is working on uh, the uh, ongoing crops. And. Um, <laughs> What is. Ah, sorry. No. Okay. Uh, uh, there is a, a steering committee of AMIS, which a number with, with banks, with uh, uh, economic institutes, um, and, and with, uh, recently with Geoglam. We have been accepted as the 11th member of the Geoglam steering committee. So what um, the Geoglam wants to do, I think I will, I will stand up and, and look at the maps because it's difficult. <laughs> um, so uh, Geoglam is going to, um, to, to strengthen the international community capacity to produce and disseminate relevant, timely and accurate information and forecasts. At national, regional and global scales through the use of other sessions. So you see that uh, you need, of course, information on agriculture, but you need information and you need uh, in situ information. So, an e coordination program, uh, which at supporting, strengthening, and articulating existing efforts, and developing capacities and awareness at national and global levels, and at disseminating the information. So what we have achieved, so first, the compromise. So the component of AMIS is operational since uh, September 2013. It's, it has a presentation of results with graphics and text. So first, we have a map with all uh, the, the general condition for all the four crops. So you see the four crops below, that is maize, wheat, soybean, and rice. And you see the conditions with uh, uh, colors, I mean, green is normal, and when it starts to be yellow and orange, it means that there start to be problems. And then we have another map for each of the four crops. When we have, this is the map, are adding driver, that is why, what is the reason when there is in one region a problem with the crop that is not in normal. Um, then we have another way of predicting is that we the total option is the second one, and you have the same colors um, which are here, and you have the drivers which are the reasons for for which there is a problem when it is green, and we have the same of course for each of the crops. 
and we have even the same graph for the export and you see for example the first exporter is no more exporter. And you see that Thailand which is a major exporter in that year is in orange, which means the that means it will have an, certainly an influence on the market because there will be less rice available, so the price might go up. It's developed by a number of institutions. You have the names over there. And um, it's operational since uh, February 2016, more than a year ago. And on that year, we had... Uh, when we started, we had a very uh, strong event in South the the And uh, on that crops, we are adding uh, one new condition, which is failure, that is in some can see here. No crops at all. And And delayed onset, delayed onset is the, the, the rains are supposed to come. People plant put the seed in the ground, but the, the, the thing, and then the, the, the seeds are lost. So, if we look at global monitoring, you can see that both crop monitors they are covering almost all the world. You see a white thing, which is Mongolia, but because why in Mongolia there are mainly rangelands, and you will hear in the next presentation that we have an activity we call RAP which is concerned with rangeland, so I think Mongolia will come on our map uh, shortly. Um, and if we look to the sustainable development uh, um, uh, goals, we need to, uh, to go through economics, and in economics you have uh, the information asymmetry theory, which says that um, it's, it's about uh, decisions when, when one party um, has more information than the others, when we have not the same information. And the consequence is that the transactions uh, are not going well, and sometimes they are even market failure. And from the 70s, there were a number of economists, Akerlof, Spence, and Stiglitz, who published papers on that subject. And that resulted that in 2001, these three people got the Nobel Prize in economics for that by saying we should have the same information. And now if we look to, to Geoglam, in fact, by producing and openly disseminating relevant, timely, and accurate information and forecast on agricultural production, Geoglam contributes to an efficient functioning of the market. And if we look to the SDG number two and longer, which is um, to adopt, and, and in particular, the, the Apple to C, which is adopt measure to ensure the proper functioning of food commodity markets and their derivatives, and facilitate, facilitate timely access to market information, including on food reserves, we, we see that, in fact, by producing and openly, we are directly contributing to that, to that uh, SDG goal. So, in fact, I have, I have presented you the, the end uh, object that is mainly evidence-based information, which is here. Uh, but, of course, behind, you need research, you need to develop products, and then turn them into more operational, and then finally to operational products. Um, I have not given uh, many words to what we hear now, that is, apart from crops and agriculture, you have and livestock in some areas which are important, and we are in, a, in an area which is like that, and you will hear more about this. So, so Jordan is um, an, an efficient uh, cooperation, international cooperation. You have here a number of institutions. Uh, which are participating to that, and uh, we, we, we think that we, we could extend that to, to the Balkan area and, and, uh, and develop activities that will make uh, EO more useful in that area with the help of the local partners. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you Michel, for giving us an overview in uh, what GeoGlam does. And before I pass the floor uh, to Juan to tell us about GeoGlam RAP, I would like to give the floor uh, to Brian Killam and address the question. I'm going to say that in Greek. Brian, I don't know if you understand. Brian, uh, I, I will speak in, in Greek. Uh, mentioned the importance of cube 
working for Gelglam and Gelglam Rap later on. Postal peripheral system at Parat. How the satellite Earth observation systems and what are the perspectives through the use of this tool, which is called Cube? Uh, you have uh, the time to make us a quick presentation on uh, the point and perspective uh, from the cube uh, point of view, uh, how and what data we can get through cube. Thank you, Brian. The floor is yours. Okay, thank you. Uh, can you hear me okay? Yes, we can. Hello? That, that was uh, yes? Yes. Okay, great. Um, could you give me the controls to uh, share my screen? Is that possible? Yes. Yes, can you hear me? I will make you presenter so you can uh, show us. Okay. Okay, one minute, please. Okay, now you are presented. Okay. Okay. How's that? Good? Yeah, we are watching the... Excellent. Okay, thank you. Uh, thanks for the opportunity to talk with you a little bit about uh, data cubes and what we're doing in, in CIOS. So uh, thankful that I can do this today. Let me see if I uh, get this right. So a, a few things to bring to your attention and how we're using CIOS data to support sustainable development goals. There's two key things. One is the focus on analysis-ready data. Something we're doing within CIOS is taking advantage of the capability to pre-process the data, put it into an analysis-ready data format so that we minimize the burden on the user. The second thing is Open Data Cube. We've been working quite hard within the last year or two to explore this new technology. As Barb mentioned in her initial presentation, uh, there are a number of advantages to using this. And also Barb mentioned the proliferation of free and open data since 2007, which is when Landsat released its archive. Since that time, uh, we've seen a, a large increase in free and open data sets, such as the Sentinels. So we really think there's an, a, an enormous opportunity in the future for us to utilize this data and to try to find the, the proper tools and processes to take advantage of it. So there are certainly some challenges, but at the same time, there are some great opportunities ahead of us. So to tell you just briefly uh, what is a data cube, for those of you that are not familiar with it, uh, think of this as a time series stack of uh, spatial information. If I were to take many scenes that you see in that stack and then place, uh, take out the pixel information and stack them into a cube, what it does is relieve the user of dealing with the individual scene files and stores that pixel information in a database format so that it's highly accessible and you are able to run algorithms and perform uh, analytics on that in a much more efficient way. Everything we're doing in CIOS with this approach is open source software. It's free and open. Uh, we're not charging for any of this, and all of these tools and services uh, we hope are available to the world. Uh, you know, our goal in all of this is to provide a solution. And from what we understand from the users, uh, there's been a number of issues regarding data preparation and, and how to deal with large quantities of data. And, and we hope that the DataCube is a solution that has value for our users. Uh, to briefly tell you about our vision, we, we think that the DataCube has an opportunity to support all kinds of agendas, both from uh, uh, ones that GEO has in their portfolio, as well as the UN Sustainable Development Goals. Uh, CIOS is focused on these analysis-ready data products. We are putting out data cubes and testing them all throughout the world. And we have an internal goal. Our goal that we've set for ourselves is to have operational data cubes in 20 countries within the next five years. 
And uh, though I think that will be a challenge, I also think it's possible to do that. And with the help of partners like GEO and World Bank and individual countries, I believe we can get there. This is just a look at where we are in that um, I call it the road to 20. I'd like to get to 20 countries in five years. And as you see, the, the green boxes, Australia, Switzerland, and Colombia are three operational data cubes that we have already put in place. Um, obviously, Australia was the originator of everything with the data cube. Also in development are the blue boxes. So the United States has an LC map project, which is uh, putting all their Landsat data in a cube. Uh, they're going to start out with the U.S. and then make it broader. We have a cube under development in Uganda, one in Vietnam, and one in Taiwan. All of those are moving quite rapidly. And all of the boxes you see in red are 16 additional countries. And I have put one over uh, the Balkan region, as you see there. So I believe the, the Balkans and that this is what this meeting is all about. There's, there's no reason that the Balkans uh, couldn't be one of our next uh, examples of the data cube. So just a few other things to mention, just so that you get a feel for what the potential is for the cubes. There is a website, uh, I'll, I'll repeat this at the end of my presentation, but we have a user interface tool with 15 sample data cubes all throughout the world, uh, seven different applications, everything from cloud filtering to fractional cover, vegetation, water, uh, landslides, and coastal change. Uh, what we've decided is that in order to get people familiar with the data cube, if we put out some sample cubes and this user interface, it's on an Amazon web, it's completely free and open, it will give people an idea of what the cube uh, can do and its potential. Uh, this is just an example here of, if I can get this animation running, this is a time series animation of 17 years uh, of water detection over a portion of Lake Chad. This is a portion of Lake Chad with the Chari River on the uh, middle right. And uh, this portion is over Cameroon. And what you see is over time, this is the percent of time that an individual pixel has seen water over 17 years. Here's another example of fractional cover. Uh, you'll see this in Wonderson's presentation today. But fractional cover is a way to represent land classification in three buckets. And it's, uh, we, we see every pixel as a combination of either bare soil, photosynthetic vegetation in green, or non-photosynthetic in, in blue. And as you see in this complicated picture here, this is again that same Chari River structure heading into Lake Chad which has a large amount of bare soil, vegetation uh, close to the lake, and you can get a, a, an idea of the diversity of the landscape. Um, agriculture change is another uh, possibility. This is a time series animation. And what you see pointing at that one pixel in the screen, this time series over about uh, 16 years shows a change and the change that you're seeing is from the beginning, from 1998 until about 2004, there was a cycling of this particular pixel through seasonal cycling. And then something happened around 2004, and from that point forward, there was far more green. What has probably happened is this was a cropping cycle that then turned into a grassland that maintained a, a greenness in the grass for a period of time. And this is NDVI anomaly. Uh, vegetation indices are something that uh, are of high importance to the agricultural community. This particular case you're seeing here is a Landsat scene in April of 2016 compared to April in the four years prior. And what it says is that in this particular scene in 2016, there is more greenness along the border of uh, Lake Chad and dryness here at the mouth of this uh, uh, river inlet than compared to the four years prior. Uh, this kind of information is exactly what the GeoGlam Crop Monitor product is built upon. But in the case that we have here with the data cube, we have a spatial resolution of 30 meter pixels, whereas they're using MODIS at 250 meters. Quite a bit of difference. So uh, with that, I just wanted to briefly uh, give you some, some background on data cubes. Uh, if anybody has any questions or further uh, 
things that you'd like to know about the data cube, uh, feel free to come contact me directly. And uh, I'd like to say a faristoboli. We thank you for this uh, excellent presentation. And so we would like you to stay with us until the end for the questions. Uh, this sure uh, upper view for the Balkans has been discussed. And that means that we're going to have a case study in Balkans with your help. But I do have a question before I pass the microphone to the next speaker. Uh, I'm a of course, and since we talk about Cube, uh, do you think that, uh, of course, and you mentioned that Sentinel is up there, we can combine Cube with uh, the Sentinel data, and then having said that, I will pass straight the microphone to Espen Bolden to tell us about the agro platform that ESA is developing, and of course we want to put all these things together. Uh, Brian, you can have a short answer to my question, and then I'll pass the microphone to Espen. Yes, um, we are certainly working on the uh, on Sentinel data in the cube. At this point, we have already shown uh, in our Vietnam cube that we can combine Sentinel-1 radar data with optical Landsat data in the same cube using the same spatial alignment. The, the, the real nice thing about the data cube is it gives you the ability to stack the pixels and spatially align them. So if I'm looking at a Sentinel-1 radar pixel, I know exactly where that uh, pixel aligns itself with the um, Landsat pixel in the same exact location. And so we have uh, done this for Vietnam. We can certainly do this for any other region. We have not quite done it for Sentinel-2 data yet, only because some of the atmospheric correction algorithms are still under review. But uh, it is our goal to have a, a, a simple method to pull together Landsat, Sentinel-1, and Sentinel-2 all within a cube, which will give immense power and capability. Thank you very much, Brian. And now, Espen, the floor is yours. Since uh, we are still going to have uh, for half an hour the minister with us, but uh, then we are going to have also, you remember our discussion, it is uh, the Joe Glamrap presentation. So, Espen, the floor is yours to tell us what it is that you are doing concerning the agri platform and also this initiative Balkan support. Thank you. Thank you very Thank much, you. George. Uh, can you hear me? I think it's clear, yeah. Yes, you can hear me. And, and you can see this slide is covering the whole screen? Yes, we can see it very well. Perfect. So uh, thank you very much for having uh, invited uh, ESA to provide uh, some contribution to this uh, event. Uh, I'm here together with, uh, with Gordon Campbell, so we will do the presentation in a shared way. I will start focusing on food security, yeah. and Gordon will uh, uh, fin finish by uh, um, talking a bit more about our uh, of the regional ex um, aspects. So um, I'm, I'm going to present. Sorry, that is very small. You have to. The presentation is very too small in the picture. Okay, let's see. Yeah, yeah. Now it's okay, okay, you can continue. Okay, perfect. So we are uh, collaborating with the European Commission on the European uh, Earth Observation Program called Copernicus. Uh, it's the most uh, ambitious Earth Observation Program in the world. Uh, at NASA, we are responsible for the for the space components. We are developing uh, six different families of satellites that you can see on, uh, on top uh, of the slides here. Of which, at least the three, uh, the three to the left, are really uh, very powerful for supporting uh, agriculture. Um, what is very important about the Copernicus satellite is that the data are free and open. So as you can see, we have learned the lessons from uh, from uh, Barbara Ryan and USGS and what they did with the Landsat data. 
And the second thing which is really important is that uh, it's an operational program. It means that the data will be there for at least up to 2030. So we, are, we have ensured financing for into the 20, uh, 2030s, and of course the ambition is to, to go on further than that also. That means that the user can start using our data, uh, take, uh, take up new processes for working, and be sure that the data will be there in the future. Now, one example for what we can do uh, uh, concretely with this uh, Sentinels. Uh, this is from uh, from Czech Republic, so you basically see the whole Czech uh, Republic here. Um, so what we did here is that we used both uh, the high-resolution radar satellite and the optical satellite, uh, which provides uh, data every six and five days, uh, respectively, and even more frequent uh, over, over Europe. And we also used uh, information from Czech Republic, uh, like their uh, national land parcel identification system. And we used uh, machine learning techniques. And with this, we could produce information like crop type maps and crop maps uh, over the whole country, as you can see here. And uh, specifically, the fact of combining both optical and radar and having these dense time series that allowed us to do really dynamic crop mapping, which could not be done before. And before we had to wait until the end of the season, now we can do this during the season and provide really timely information. Um, so that is really uh, something uh, which uh, the users that were involved here from, uh, from the Czech uh, Agriculture Ministry are really happy about. Uh, we can also regularly monitoring uh, agricultural activities, uh, for example, uh, flowing and, and grass and cutting as well. Um, the European Commission was involved in this. And here you can see uh, Commissioner Hogan uh, stating that uh, already paying agencies of the, of the European Union use data of the Sentinels, and that in the near future, a satellite monitoring of the parcels could replace most of this on-the-spot check that uh, has been, is being done now and which is very costly. So this kind of simplification is very much uh, in his plan system. And he also announced a new project that we're doing in, in, in uh, ESA together with uh, several uh, countries in order to really demonstrate this further and, and be uh, sure that in the, in the CUP, uh, uh, so the Common Agricultural Policy Reform for 2020, Sentinels will be operationally used. Uh, for time, I will skip that. Um, I show you another example. That's uh, growth monitoring in uh, in Mali. So we, here we can see. Okay, we mapped whole Mali, but this is an example where we zoom in, so you can leave, really see at uh, field level. So having made the crop type um, maps. We can focus, for example, only on cotton, and we can see uh, the, money or the evolution of the crop during the season. You see the dates on the right side, 5th October, 25th uh, October, etc. And you can really follow the, the, the monitoring and the evolution of, of, the, of the crop, of the cotton in this case. Um, so these were examples of what we can do with the Sentinels. Uh, now I will present you uh, what we are uh, now uh, developing, which we call the Food Security Thematic Exploitation Platform. So this one uh, will support uh, sustainable agriculture and also aquaculture by facilitating the development and production of Earth observation-based products and services. Uh, so it will provide Earth observation data, uh, Copernicus data, uh, of course, but also other uh, data, for example, Landsat but also other types of data and silly data like uh, terrain data, soil data, etc. And in, the, in addition to that, also tools for processing this and doing analytics. Uh, all of this in a cloud environment and together with computing resources. So everything will be in one place and there will be no need for downloading huge satellite data files. So what we say is that instead of bringing data to the users, we bring the users to the data and the tools. So this, this uh, platform will have uh, three different interfaces. The first being uh, uh, for expert users, uh, which we call essential. Uh, it will provide a really comprehensive access to the, all the tools and data, uh, and so that people also can, they can either use tools that are already there, but they can also upload their own uh, algorithms to the platform and run them on the data which, which, they are, which are on, on the platform. 
and then of course uh, produce different types of results which they then also can um, publish on the platform. Um, there is a second interface which is called mobile. This will provide uh, more uh, visual information uh, that people can then retrieve on their mobile devices, uh, for example, when they are in the field. So retrieve information from satellite imagery about the field where they are, and at the same time also uh, upload the uh, observation that they do in the field back to the system. I said there were three interfaces, so the third one uh, is called uh, Cosmast. And here, uh, users can search based commercial uh, Earth observation based uh, services. Um, we will do, uh, while we have, when we have a first version of the platform, we will start doing some service pilots to demonstrate uh, um, the functionalities of it. And the first pilot we will do is in uh, both in Europe and Africa, uh, where we will provide the uh, information. Uh, to both farmers and agro-industry, uh, information like chlorophyll content, uh, yield forecast, uh, etc. Uh, later we will do a, another pilot uh, only in Africa, uh, where we will work together with the World Food Program, also with uh, uh, small companies um, providing um, or supporting farmers in obtaining uh, uh, financing. So we will uh, we will work with them to use observation in, in this process so that it will be easier for farmers to obtain in, uh, insurance and, and uh, uh, finances. And the third uh, pilot will do will be to support sustainable agriculture. Uh, so we have, uh, the, this was uh, the food security platform that we are developing now. We have also developed six other platforms which have come uh, even further in different, uh, different thematic areas. And I'd like to stress that these, these uh, platforms are very complementary to the data cubes that uh, Brian just presented. Because our platforms could, uh, could feed the data cubes with, with data. Um, then I'll just uh, show you here a slide uh, how we are working together with users uh, on this uh, subject of food security. Um, we yeah, had a workshop here in Esrin uh, one year ago where we brought together really a, a large diversity of, of users, farmers, cooperatives, uh, food security organizations, UN, NGO, scientists, insurance, uh, development aid, agro industry, etc. And we discussed and were able to understand better what really the challenges are like in food security. And, the, and they could understand really how we could help them. So from this, we, were, we worked on uh, defining what were user needs and the needs for capacity building. We discussed lessons learned from, uh, from, pe from previous activities, and we're using this to prepare new activities. So, for example, we use this for preparing this food security platform. So this partnership uh, invites you to have, uh, uh, organizations from your countries also uh, joining this uh, partnership, where we, at least we already have members from Greece. Um, then I will uh, give the word to Gordon to uh, present our re regional initiative. Gordon, thanks a lot for being here. I know that you just came from the States after a long trip, and it's just amazing that you are with us. So thank you very much, and the floor is yours. Thanks very much. I very much appreciate the opportunity, and uh, I'm a bit sad that we're not able to be physically there. but. Uh, um, this is the start of a process, I think, so we're fully supportive and we want to be physically present in the, uh, the, the next meeting of this group. Um, just, just to complement what um, Espen was saying, uh, I think one, what, okay, so he was explaining the concept of the, the thematic exploitation platforms. We've developed um, six uh, at a fairly advanced stage that are in a pre-operational phase. You guys can access these if you want. Um, and there's the food security um, currently under development. One element of the thematic exploitation platform capabilities is also the, um, the interface that the different users have is actually a sort of um, an environment that supports collaboration, access to um, customized software tools, anything, any type of capability like that that you might need as well. Um, that has been in place for thematic communities because what we're trying to do is basically demonstrate does the combination of all these capabilities, the very large data sets, the high performance uh, uh, computing, uh, all accessed via scalable cloud-based 
um, frameworks. Does that actually make a difference in terms of what you can do, or is it just a more sort of computy way, if you like, of doing stuff you can do already? Um, and what we're saying is, yeah, I mean, these things are starting to make an impact. The, you know, the, the, uh, the idea of you know, the big data analytics, having the very large data sets with the processing, uh, with the cloud-based uh, capabilities, that really is starting to make a difference in some of these thematic communities. Um, what complements that to a certain extent is rather than looking at how we can make an impact in individual thematic communities like coastal zone or forestry or urban management or whatever, um, the, what we're doing on a regional basis is um, look at groups of countries that have common interests, that have um, common or coordinated data collection, uh, that do common analyses, common reporting. Um, and we say, well, how can we get Earth observation better used in that sort of framework? Maybe there's regional environmental agreements, uh, regional Earth science programs, uh, but these things are multidisciplinary. Uh, so what, what we're putting in place now is what we're calling uh, regional initiatives, and that is um, exploitation platform capability analogous to what Espen was talking about um, for food security, but um, structured so that uh, groups of countries uh, can, uh, can, can it, 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 it's, it's accessing uh, or it's organizing the data on a geographic basis rather than a, the, rather than a thematic basis. So it's all of the data, uh, or the idea is because we're just developing it now. The idea is it'll be all of the uh, Earth observation data for a particular region, uh, plus um, progressively access to all of the, the insertion data, all of the relevant models, all of the relevant uh, processing tools, etc., for, for a given region so that we can support a range of capabilities. Um, we're not calling it a platform anymore because there will be this underlying platform capability. Um, that will obviously build on uh, existing capabilities that we've developed already in the, image, in the individual thematic exploitation platforms or other capabilities that have been um, uh, developed elsewhere. I mean, this, this is a, a totally open uh, environment so that you know, any, any relevant capability should be integrable. Uh, or connectable and interoperable in, into this environment. And what, what we want still to do, as well as this platform capability, is look at a sort of um, uh, a, a set of customised earth science developments, so we can address the regional earth science priorities, and a set of customised application developments, so that we can address the, the um, better integration of earth observation into the regional environmental agreements, etc. And just I think what this slide is showing is just all of the different. Uh, elements that we're trying to address uh, in a particular region with this sort of capability. So we would look at things like national reporting to uh, regional environmental agreements or uh, re uh, regional uh, implementation of um, international agreements or European agreements like European directives. We would look at supporting uh, um, communication, citizen engagement, education, etc., in a more dynamic way. So we're not just looking at static data sets. You can have a much more uh, dynamic interaction with, with, uh, with, with the underlying data. We look at development of uh, uh, customized applications and services for the region, support cooperative research in the region, uh, support any of the regional strategies, like um, the, the, the Baltic strategy or the Baltic strategy or the Atlantic regional strategy at European Union level, um, as well as if there's uh, international uh, or intergovernment or pan national uh, regional strategies uh, in, in other frameworks, we would support these with, with always the access to the data, the access to the analysis, and the connection of all of the different data sets into this collaborative environment that people uh, could uh, uh, could work together inside. So that, that's what we're uh, uh, that's what we're, we're uh, just starting. We've started two pathfinders to decide how we would do something. One for the Danube and the Black Sea, and one for the Atlantic. Um, we're going to start three uh, at the end of this year or early next year. Uh, full implementation, which is full implementation of something for the Atlantic, full implementation of something uh, for the Baltic, and full implementation of something for the uh, for the Black Sea and Danube. As we're going ahead, I mean, clearly the Balkans is another region uh, where we would be interested in understanding how uh, the scope for implementing uh, a, a similar initiative there at regional level. And then we'd like to sort of get everybody together and understand what the priorities are, what the uh, implementation approach would be. And just to give you a, um, a sort of more schematic um, box diagram of how the uh, uh, how all the capabilities fit together. So we look at, I mean, if you look at the top, so we've got all the sort of the high-level regional uh, things that people want to do. So 
Like you say, for example, there's uh, if you look at the Baltic region, there's a number, there's two or three uh, regional earth science programs, Baltic Earth. Um, I can't remember what the others are called. And they're, they're, they've got defined objectives. They've got defined cooperation uh, activities. They have regional agreements like HELCOM um, that have regional reporting and regional analysis and regional objectives. And there's regional strategies. So all of these things need uh, customized developments. And they, like I say, the, exploita the regional exploitation platform capabilities would support that. The, underneath these, um, there's all the other infrastructure, so the thematic exploitation platforms, national collaborative ground segment infrastructure is another very important contribution to this. And underlying all of that, I think, is the DS capability, the data information and just DS stand for about data information and application service, something like that. It's a infrastructure we're going to be implementing, uh, funded by the European Commission, uh, that will give uh, data to the service with hosted processing for all of the Sentinel data. Um, hopefully by the end of this year, um, it should be up and running, as well as access to all things like all of the in situ data, all of the basic um, Copernicus core service. All of these capabilities would be. Uh, you can't really, you obviously can access all these things directly as as general core pan European or global capabilities, but accessing these through a, a sort of regionally customised approach. Uh, is the sort of added value we'd be trying to offer there, and the filter to these generic capabilities would be uh, a sort of a regionally optimized filter. So that, that sort of capabilities um, we'll be developing for other regions, and clearly we're quite we're very interested to uh, get something like that up and running for the uh, for the Balkan region as well. So I think that that was that's just you know this is uh, not as advanced as the sort of thematic capabilities that Espen was talking about. But it's the next thing we're, we're, um, uh, we're, we're working on, and just to give you a bit of a, um, um, a, a view, if you like, as to the, sort of the next thing that's coming down the line that you guys uh, might be able to uh, make use of. So um, thank you again for the opportunity to uh, present to you, and uh, in particular for being able to present to you remotely. And yeah, we look forward to being physically present at the uh, at the next meeting of this group. Thank you very much. Thank you, Gordon, for your uh, excellent, really presentation of what's happening at the regional level. And uh, we hope that what we are trying to build through this initiative, which hopefully we we'll call it Balkan Geo SSS, and hopefully will be integrated with Euro Geo SSS. On 5th of July, we have a high European level group meeting where we are going to be discussing about DS and the Euro GSSS. So what we hope is really to integrate uh, what we are going to start to build regionally at the European Euro GSSS. And uh, we hope that your contribution and your help in this effort will be greatly. Echo